sit a bit like this. Okay. Make sure you get a copy of the video and everything. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alamin. Wa sallallahu ala nabina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Amma ba'd. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Inshallah I will be moderating your questions and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make this sitting a blessed one and most beneficial to all of us. Inshallah the first question is directed to Sheikh Saeed Ragi. The question says like this. Please make dua for me. I'm a young Muslim lady. I talked to my parents several times with the intention of marriage. Because university environment was challenging. <clears throat> Unfortunately, they kept turning me down and telling me my priorities are misplaced. It's unfortunate because our relationship changed and I went into Zina because of influence and they would never know. Alhamdulillah, I'm finding my way back. Please advise our parents. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim wa salatu wa salam ala rasulihi al karim sayyidina wa nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in uh, when we hear such a question really um, we cry but we, we don't cry we should not cry normal tears we should cry blood because this young lady subhanallah she was pushed to a corner where she committed zina Simply because her parents, they thought the priority for her is to finish education before marriage until she fought, she went through that uh, route. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive the parents. When Ibn Uthameen was alive, because we had similar issues, I went and I traveled and I sat in front of him and I said, Ya Sheikh, our, some of the parents they are so focused about the education, which is very important. And they don't allow young people to get married. And they said, you only get married when you finish your education because your priority is your education first. And these young people, they're coming to me. I was in the state those days. And they say, we are afraid of committing zina. What should we do? Wallahi alladhi la ilaha illa huwa. Qala shaykh ya Sa'id zawwijhum wa la karama. This is very powerful statement. I still remember the statement of the Sheikh. You know, which is very serious. Ibn Uthameen, when I told him, he, you know, he got very frustrated, very upset. And he said, if this is the case and you verify the situation and these young people are not fabricating this and you talk to the parents and they saying, you know, you're not getting married until you finish your school and he or she is afraid of zina and they have someone that you're already dealing with. He said, this is a serious issue. I will say to the parents, what do you think is the priority for your child? Is it education, good job, degree, you know, or the dean itself? If you think their priority, the, high, the top priority should be education and degrees and wealth, then I think you have issues with those priorities. The priority should be the dean first. And if your child is coming to you and saying, I'm afraid of committing zina and I want a halal person, I want to marry someone and be with someone in a halal way, what would you refuse that ni'mah? If the person's deen is good as Allah, as the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, He said, if a man comes to you and you satisfy with his deen and his, matter, let, and, and his manners, let him marry your daughters. Because he said, if you don't do it, there would be fitna and fasad fil ard on earth. 
So this is exactly what this young lady is complaining about, or what she experienced. We make dua for this young lady, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to strengthen her iman. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive, uh, to forgive her uh, previous sins, but we say to the parents, fear Allah concerning your children because indeed they are a man and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would ask you about this. And I will say to these young ladies and to these young men, if your parents do not have that understanding, you yourself should fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and do not traps of shaitan to, or shaitan to fool you and put traps in front of you because shaitan will beautify zina and ma'asiyah and until you fall into it. And this sister, inshallah, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala once again to bring her back to the fold of Islam and strengthen iman. Jazakumullah khair. The next, the next question goes to Sheikh Qahtani. The question states, Assalamu alaikum. I married my wife and her dad is a Muslim, but her mother was divorced and at early stage and grew up as a Christian. The way the question is, like, the mother was not a Muslim before. Now, my wife ended up growing up as a Christian. Alhamdulillah, she's a Muslim now. We have three kids, and I really try to make her pray but she is really struggling. What's your advice? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It is simply out of humility from uh, Sheikh Rahtani. Otherwise, we are supposed to ask him and hear the answers from him. So not because he's turning the microphone to me, it doesn't give me any significance. It's simply because he said, perhaps because you're living in the culture outside, you have a better access to that. But before answering the question, I need a favor from all of you. Everyone who is filming or using their phones right now to film, Please put your phones down. Please put your phones down. Why? Because simply when there are hundreds of phones filming, Allah No one has ever been given two hearts, two minds to think about the say two different things simultaneously. You think about one thing at a time. So other listening to the question and the answer. Like right now, I didn't even hear the question because I was busy with something else. It's very typical. So I have not this a lot. We have sometimes tens of thousands of audience in some of the lectures in the Arabic world. And you see equivalent to the number of phones up in filming. As a result, I keep telling them, them trust me, by the end when you, when you step out, if I ask you, about the contents of what you have filmed, you say, I'm going to review it first. I'm going to see it first. So if you have to view it in order to know what is in it, you have us all live. And in addition to there is live streaming. And if there is a particular question that you want to record it, after we finish, you can cut it and paste it. You get the segment that you want. Do not let the shaitan deceive you and say, I've got the shaykh on my phone in this clip. You will have the whole thing worth two days of lectures already online right now. Not only in this conference, brothers and sisters. Remember, you can only think about one thing at a time. Either you attend and be attentive or you film. Like the cameraman, the one who's on the crane, I promise, he doesn't know the question and he would not even know the answer. You know why? Not because he's bad or anything. 
because he is focused and thinking about moving the crane, taking the right shot. Okay? So now the question is, somebody was married to a girl who was raised by her Christian mother. Alhamdulillah, the girl have accepted Islam and they have kids and so on. But she's not praying. And he's asking about the solution. You see, brothers and sisters, I have mentioned always over the past two days and today, there is no iman without amal and salih. And the main pole, the main pillar of the stent of this religion is a salah. To the point that the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, said, Al-ahdu alladhi baynana wa baynahum as-salah fa man tarakaha faqad kafar. This is very scary. The main difference between us and non-Muslims is a prayer. Whoever does not pray, he is one of whom, not one of us. You gotta keep that out. True. Provided she's muhsana, and provided you're the upper hand. When you marry her, and you travel to, let's say, the States, or you marry her and live with her in the States, a couple of years, first, as you and I have had how many hundreds of cases like that? For this reason, because of the children, what will happen? You will lose them. You will lose them for good. She can even place her restraining order again so you will not be able to lay your eyes upon them. Because of that, it is your responsibility. Ya ayyuha al-lavina amanu qu anfusakum wa ahlikum nara. A number six of Surah Al-Tahreem. Or who you believe, you're, on, you're not only required to protect yourselves alone, but yourselves and your family members, those who are under your guardianship. It is your responsibility. So if somebody is asking me beforehand, I want to marry this girl, I say, is she Muslim? Alhamdulillah. Practicing. Um, she doesn't pray, but she is willing. Okay. When she starts praying, and when she is regular in the prayer, marry her. Not before that. Give precedence to what Allah loves over your own love in order to be successful. Okay. So, since now that is gone, now we are halfway. We're not talking about from the beginning. What shall we do? You have quite an important task to do. Like if she attends a conference like that, if she's attending, I'm very certain, inshallah, after listening to those wonderful speakers, Allah will soften her heart and she will start praying. Show her always that you're very keen to make her pray for her own good, not for you. So that you, her, and your children will be saved. Share with her the ayat in the Quran in which Allah the Almighty says, Al-Haqana bihim zurriyatahum. That those the righteous people, we will make their family members and their offspring join them, provided they deserve it. Honey, I want to be with you. That's a song, isn't it? I want to be with you in paradise. And there is only one way that we can do it. You give me a hand. Look at this beautiful hadith. Maybe this hadith will give you the solution. The Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, said, May Allah bless. May Allah reward. May Allah spare and save a person, a man who gets up at night to, to pray, the night prayer. But instead of praying by himself, he wakes up his wife to pray with him. This is a night prayer, not the fard only. And if she refuses, if she's too sleepy, he would wet his fingers. Please listen carefully to this. And you need to record that, okay? I didn't say pour a bucket of water on her. Just wet your finger. And sprinkle some droplets of water over her face in order to freshen her up. Honey, let's get up to pray. Let's pray together. And may Allah have mercy on a woman who will get up to pray at night. And she would do the same with the husband. And if he's too sleepy, she would wet her fingers. And sprinkle some droplets of water over his face. So that if they both get up and they pray, they will be recorded with Allah amongst those who remember Allah much. Nadar, may Allah make their faces bright. May Allah spare them. May Allah reward them. So this is for the night prayer. What about the farida? So encourage her to pray. Okay, let's make wudu and pray together. Practice. إِنَّمَا الصَّبْرُ بِالتَّصَبُّرُ وَإِنَّمَا الْحِلْمُ بِالتَّحَلُّمُ Abdullah ibn Umar ibn Khattab said, so it's a matter of practice. 
And guess what? God forbid, if I'm in a situation like that, and I've tried every possible mean, advising, exhorting, warning, making dua, make lots of dua in your sujood, ask Allah to make it easy for her to pray and pray on regular time, preaching, making her listen to other speakers. By the end, the outcome is zero, then I give her the ultimatum. Yes, I give her the ultimatum. And you know what the ultimatum is, don't you? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide her. May Allah make her amongst those who pray on a regular basis. May Allah open her heart to be a practicing Muslim and all of us. Amen. Ahsantum wa jazakumullah khair. We'd like to remind the shiuks that because of time, we would wish that it, the answering of the questions will just be three minutes. Jazakallah <laughs> khair. This next question goes to Sheikh Yusuf Estes. Sheikh Yusuf, this question goes to you. I think it's from a not yet Muslim. The question goes like this. Jesus was a non-violent reformer, while Muhammad fought in wars. Why is there a difference between Jesus and Muhammad in terms of their approach? Say it again. <laughs> <laughs> the question, I think, is from a not yet Muslim. It states like this. Jesus was a non-violent reformer, while Muhammad fought in wars. Why is there a difference between Jesus and Muhammad in terms of their approach? Uh, you know, are we saying that they have a different approach? Yes, that's the question. It's not me, Shah. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam rasulullah. Allah alam. First of all, if you're going to rely on sources other than Islam to answer an Islamic question, you're going to always be tied up. You're, you're never going to find the right answer. So, if you want the answer from Islam, we can only refer to the Islamic text. We can't take something else. If you want to get your answer from another religion, then use those sources. Let me say it real clear. In Islam, we don't make a distinction between the prophets. This is in the Quran itself. We don't make a distinction between them. What we know from what is quoted in the Quran, the last and final message from God to human beings, still exists in original format. So if you're used to reading translations of former revelations, get used to this because the Quran doesn't need translations. Anybody who wants to learn the Arabic language can immediately see the same exact thing, hear the same thing that was revealed to the followers of Muhammad at his time, peace be upon him. So I, I want to make it clear to you that we cannot use other references to come up with an answer from Islam. You can use those things, make comparison all you want to and, and play in your mind whatever you want to do. But if you want to say that there's a difference, then I'm not sure I know what you mean by that. The approach of all of the messengers seems very similar to me, and I'll reference it from the Quran itself. In chapter 61, called Asaf, or the straight rose, okay? It says in verse number six, actually verse before that, it says that Moses, Musa alayhi salam, said to his people, oh my people, that I'm a messenger of God to you. All right, and then you see this verse that I'm referring to now, where Jesus, peace and blessing be upon him, is essentially saying exactly the same thing. Oh, my people, and I'm a messenger of God to you, telling you so and so. But he adds to that, and a messenger to come after me, who is Mahu Ahmed, and his name is Ahmed. And Ahmed is one of the forms of Hamid, Hamid, Muhammad, the names that are referred to to the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him. So, if you were saying that they have different approaches, I'm not sure and I wouldn't be able to answer that. If you're saying that there's something in the Islamic text that tell us that, I'm not familiar with it, but then I'm not an expert on that. So, you could send me an email and we can talk about it more. And how you can do that is C-O-N-T-A-C-T, -T, contact at guide us 
or guideus.tv. Got it? Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Ahsan Allah alaik. This next question goes to Sheikh Abu Sama Dahabi. The question says like this Why do some people suffer so much in this life, especially the innocent, such as children? Bismillah, alhamdulillahi, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillahi amma ba'd. Why do people suffer at this time? The suffering of people comes as a direct result of the qadr of Allah Azza wa Jal. He decrees what he wants to decree, and in his qadr there is justice, and there is wisdom, and there is knowledge, and other than that. And he mentioned about himself in the Quran and about the people as well. لا يسأل عما يفعل وهم يسألون. Allah is not asked why he does what he does, but the people are going to be asked about why do they do what they do. So people can be in a situation where they suffer as a result of that bala and that imtihan, that fitna. The individual suffers, but it's not necessarily something that's bad. Allah is putting them through that thing in order to test them or because he loves them. Another case is that Allah Ta'ala causes people to suffer and these things are decreed upon them because Allah is making tamhis and he's making the distinction between the people. He mentioned a number of ayahs of the Quran, حَسِبْتُ مَنْ تَدْخُلْ الْجَنَّةِ وَلَمَّا يَأْتِكُمْ مَثَلُ الَّذِينَ خَرُوا مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ You think you're going to go into the Jannah without being tried like the people were tried before you? If Islam was easy, everybody would be a Muslim. But we have to fast in the month of Ramadan. In the UK, we have to fast for 20 hours, 18 hours. Our women have to wear jilbab and niqab and we have to do so many things. If Islam was easy, meaning anybody could do it, then everybody would be a Muslim. So... The main thing that I want to get across to the audience here today is we have to be careful about these types of questions. We have to be careful about these types of questions. Person is in, he's inquisitive, he wants to know, no problem. But at the end of the day, we understand that Allah Ta'ala does what he wants to do and we have to be patient with his qadr and we have to deal with it in the best way possible knowing that Allah Ta'ala doesn't oppress anyone. So when people suffer, he doesn't oppress anyone. And when people go through these things, they have the ability to deal with it. It's not beyond their scope. And Allah is a'la and a'la. Ahsanallah alayk. A reminder to most of our brothers and sisters who sent questions. There are a lot of questions and we just selected a few that we thought that is very important. As for those who want their questions to be answered, Sheikh Asim al-Hakim has a website where he will answer your question within 48 hours. We'll put up the website, inshallah, you'll see it up there. This next question goes to you, Shaykhana, Shaykh Haseem. How are we supposed to repent from backbiting as we backbite many people dead and alive? Bismillah, alhamdulillah, salatu wa salamu ala rasulillahi wa alihi wa sahbihi man ihtada bi huda. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, whoever has wronged his brother in this dunya, he must there is no dirham. Whoever you wrong, you must clear it with him in this life. I take your money. You don't know about it. I repent. I must give you the money back. Now, this is not as easy as a walk in the park. In Saudi, we don't have parks. It's hot. We come here, inshallah, we enjoy the walk. You have to look at the consequences of your actions as in every single step you make. In Islam, before you do something, think of the consequence. Destroying the idols that the kafir worship or abusing him or discrediting them is a good thing. But if it leads to something more heinous, and that is insulting Allah Azza wa Jalla, Allah tells you refrain. Do not insult the idols that they worship other than Allah so that they would not insult Allah himself. Therefore, if I backbite Abu Usama, he's a big man. And if I go to him and say, Akhi, I have wronged you and I did ghibah on you. He smacked me in the face. 
He'll redecorate my face. Nothing can be worse than this. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, it would be better than cosmetic surgery. But this is haram. Why? Because it would cause enmity. So many people come to you and say, Akhi, I did backbiting to you. So forgive me. He said, what did you say? I said you were short, fat, and ugly. <laughs> so I will never forgive you. So the consequences are far greater than concealing your backbiting uh, uh, um, endeavor. So what to do if the consequences are greater? Pray for them. If I backbit someone and said he's fat, short, and ugly, in the following gathering I would say, the brother is very generous. Mention true things about him. He's so kind to his parents. His children are, mashallah, a pearl to uh, look at. So try to cover up things, but do not lie, because this would make two more sins uh, in addition to the previous one. Also pray for them in, the, uh, in their absence. Oh Allah, forgive them. Oh Allah, rectify their affairs. Oh Allah, have mercy on them. Inshallah, this would compensate. And this is exactly three minutes. So, the next question goes to our very own local Sheikh, Sheikh Abdul Latif. This question goes to you. He said, my question is, we have a recurring drought in our land, many parts of Kenya, and very severe one in Somalia. What are the causes that lead to this, and what is the best thing to do when it occurs? Okay, I repeat the question. Okay. The question says like this. We have a recurring drought in our land, many parts of Kenya, and very severe one in Somalia. Please remind us what are the causes and the best thing to do when it occurs from the Sharia perspective. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salam ala rasulullah wa ala alihi wa ashabi ajma'in amma ba'ad. Just like uh, Sheikh uh, uh, Abu Sama mentioned, uh, it can be from this different perspective. Uh, it can be Qadha wa qadr Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has destined. Uh, it can be as a result of our sins. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Dhar al-fasad fil barru wa al-bahri bima kasabat aydi nas Yeah. Uh, the, uh, some of the calamities uh, we get uh, as a result of our bad deeds we do. Um, uh, uh, what can we do? Uh, we have to go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and repent and ask tawbah and maghfirah uh, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And uh, the other things we can do is uh, uh, like alhamdulillah last week and, and some few days uh, ago uh, we've been uh, collecting uh, funds, food, clothing and so on and so forth so that we can share uh, with our brothers and sisters uh, who don't have. So uh, on the spiritual perspective we have to go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, on the social perspective, we, we have to do something about it. Uh, Alhamdulillah, we share for the ones who, who don't, to give to, to those who, who have. Allah wa'ala. Ahsanallah This next question goes to Sheikh Ahtani. The question states like this. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, if you love someone, tell him, can I tell a girl I love you for the sake of Allah? Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salam wa rasulullah. بالتأكيد يمكنك أن تقول ذلك بعد أن تتزوجها. He said, uh, he said, you can say that. Of course, you can say that after you marry her. ولكن لا تقول أحبك في الله. But don't say I love you for the sake of Allah. تقول لا أحب أحبك فقط. Just say I love you only. وأما قبل ذلك فهذا ليس حب لله هذا حب للشيطان. He said before the marriage that is not حب for the sake of Allah that's a حب that's a love for the sake of شيطان. 
يكفي هذا اليوم This is enough for us. السؤال الثاني لي كل واحد أخذ أربع دقائق أو أنا أخذ دقيقة واحدة. He said give me, he said give me the second question because every sheikh took four minutes and only took two minutes. طيب the next question goes to Sheikh Ahtani. Can a person perform witr during the day if he fails to perform during the night? All your horses slow down, inshallah. طيب can a person perform witr during the day if he fails to perform witr salat al witr? If he fails to perform during the night, can he make up the next day? هذا معروف وهو قضاء النوافل عموما وترا أو غيرها. He said this is known and this is praying or making up the nafil in general, voluntary prayers in general. تقول عائشة رضي الله عنها. عائشة رضي الله عنها said. كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم. The Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم used to. إذا فاته حزبه من الليل، if he misses his portion of the night، صلى من النهار ثنتي عشرة ركعة. he will perform during the daytime twelve ركعات. فالوتر إذا فاتنا ليلا، you see if we miss witr during the night time، يصليه في النهار من بين طلوع بعد طلوع الشمس إلى قبل صلاة الظهر. you say we pray after after sun. صلي بصفة الوتر. However, we don't pray the exact the same way that we pray witr usually. ولكن نصليه شفعا. But we pray we do two rak'ah instead of witr. فمثلا لو كنت توتر بثلاث ركعات. He said if you used to do and conclude your prayers with three rak'ah. تصلي في النهار أربع ركعات. Now during the daytime you perform four rak'ah. وهكذا خمس تصبح ست وسبع تصبح ثمان بهذه الطريقة. Likewise, if you used to pray five, it becomes six, and if you pray seven, it becomes eight, and so on. وهل يمكن قضاء بقية النوافل مثل الضحى لو فاتتك؟ He said, is it permissible? Is the question that he's posing is it permissible to make up a salat that you miss a nafil that you miss such as duha, duha prayers, وسائر النوافل الأخرى, and the rest of the voluntary prayers, الرواتب, and the sunnah. الصحيح من قول أهل العلم أنه يجوز ذلك. He said, according to the most authentic opinion of the of the scholars, that is permissible. The next question goes to Sheikh Ahtani again. Al, I asked the Give me the question and I'll give it. I'll refer to him, inshallah. The question states like this: When a non-Muslim converts to Islam, all his sins are forgiven once he takes a shahada. Can a Muslim take shahada again and will? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> طيب طيب جميل هذا السؤال جدا. He said this is a beautiful question. يعني أفضل سؤال سمعته في حياتي. He said this is the best question I ever heard in my life. وهو سؤال سئله العلماء قبل ذلك. He said this question was asked his scholars before. فقد سئلوا بهذا بهذا النص. They were asked in a similar in this context. الكافر إذا أسلم ونطق الشهادتين. A non-Muslim if he becomes a Muslim and he pronounces two shahada. يتوب الله له ويغفر له جميع ذنوبه قبل الإسلام. Allah subhanahu wa taala will overlook and forgive all his sins before Islam. فهل يمكن أن يكون ذلك للمسلم؟ Can also that be for Muslim? فقرر العلماء قاعدة مشهورة معلومة. And now then the علماء came up with a principle that is well known and respected. احفظوها. Now memorize this principle. يقول العلماء. The علماء they say. المسلم بتوبته. The Muslim through his repentance. أسعد من الكافر بإسلامه. Is more happier than a kafir of with his Islam. إذا كان يتوب الله على الكافر بمجرد نطقه للشهادة. If Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is willing to forgive the non-Muslim just by pronouncing the shahad. ويغفر له ذنوبه. And he will forgive and he forgives all his sins. فإن ذلك للمسلم وزيادة. Then a Muslim has that and better and more, inshallah. يبدل الله سيئاتهم حسنات. And he recited the ayah, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala changed their sins into good deeds. فا 
فقط بيننا وبين الله نقول استغفر الله. He said the only obstacle between us and Allah is for us to say oh Allah forgive me. هذا هو الجواب. This is the answer. قل استغفر الله. Say I, oh Allah forgive me. واتوب اليه. Oh, and I repent to him. بصدق من قلبك. With sincere deep from your heart. يغفر الله لك ذنوب. And Allah will forgive all your sins. احسن الله اليك. This next question goes to Sheikh Saeed. The sister says, there is a friend of mine, every time I invite her to Islamic events like this one, she declines, saying that there is no need to attend as she does not gain anything. She, sh she says she leaves the same way she came. What should I tell a friend like that? What would you advise her? Shukran. Do you understand? There is a friend of mine, every time I invite her to Islamic events like this one, she declines, saying that there is no need to attend as she does not gain anything. She says she lives the same way she came. What should I tell a friend like that? Like that what would you advise her? First of all, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, Remind, indeed, remind it will benefit the believers. This is very crucial. All of us, I don't think none of you learn new knowledge. We keep repeating the same ayat and the same hadith again and again. But the purpose of this beautiful gathering is to gain more iman, is to ignite. Now, as Sheikh Abu Sama said earlier, you know, these places are not for you know, actual knowledge. This is for us, mashallah, tabarakah, to find that little spark for iman, for yani, dif'ah, it's a push for iman bi idnillah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when Sheikh Muhammad Salah comes here and reminds you of the ayah that you already read it before, and he reminds you of the hadith of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and then Sheikh Qahtani he comes and he tells you the story of the Sahaba, and Sheikh Asim, and so on, this is a reminder. If this is, doesn't benefit you, then you should reflect on yourself. Because Allah said in the Quran, as I stated, indeed, re remind, remind it will benefit the believer. So if this is not benefiting you, then you should question yourself. Why is this not benefiting me? Why am I, what, what am I doing wrong that this Quran is not penetrating my heart? What am I doing wrong that this hadith is, that this hadith is not sinking into my heart? Why what am I doing wrong that I came, like subhanAllah, one of the, I, I don't remember, one of the speakers was saying, if you go back the same way that you came in, you did not gain anything from this conference. So the lesson, the purpose of the conference is to gain that iman boost and then go back and continue from there, bi'idnillah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if you have that sister, ask the sister to question her iman because this is a serious issue for her. Wallahu a'ala wa'ala. The next question goes to Sheikh Muhammad Salah. What stand can we take when scholars conflict on matters that are not well illustrated in both the hadith and the Quran? Of course, this is one of the subjects, I hope you understood the question, which what Sheikh Saeed was referring to earlier should be addressed in Majalis al-Ilm in detail explanation of knowledge like how to bring harmony to conflict in evidences not only between the Sunnah and the Quran sometimes between the Quran and another ayah of the Quran in Surah uh, Al-An'am there is an ayah in which Allah the Almighty stated that الذين آمنوا ولم يلبسوا إيمانهم بظلم أولئك لهم الأمن وهم مهتدون. Security on the day of judgment will be given to whom? Those who believe ولم يلبسوا إيمانهم بظلم يعني they did not pollute their iman with any ظلم. The word ظلم literally means wrongdoing. Furthermore, means injustice. So if you want to receive security on the day of judgment which may be interpreted as salvation. If you want to be saved on the day of resurrection, then you should believe and you should not commit any sins. So the companions knelt down. Uh, who can afford to do that? There is an ayah in the Quran which says, 
وما أبرئ نفسي إن النفس لأمارة بالسوء إلا ما رحم ربي One self is inclined into evil by nature This is a human nature And there is a hadith In which the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم says كل بني آدم خطاء All the children of Adam are inclined into sinning by nature وخير الخطائين التوابو And the best of those who commit sins are those who repent upon committing sins so the companions felt this ayah is like a threat very heavy the prophet ﷺ corrected their understanding and they brought harmony to the ayah with another ayah he said it is not like what you're thinking it is not like what you're thinking so what is it a zulm in this ayah of surah al-an'am chapter number seven is explained in the other surah surah luqman when Luqman was advising his son saying يا بني لا تشرك بالله إن الشرك لظلم عظيم Oh my dear son do not associate partners to Allah in worship indeed associating partners to Allah in worship is a great ظلم so the ayah of surah al-an'am is referring to this kind of ظلم you believe and you do not associate any partners to Allah in worship you shall receive security on the day of judgment so for a layman it is very hard to bring harmony or compromise or try to understand this hadith in the light of this ayah. Not only that, sometimes conflicting a hadith. How is that? Somebody would read the hadith. Right now, Shaykh Qahtani, may Allah bless him, said that it is also prescribed to make up the missed duha prayer. To that extent, do you know how many opinions with regards to the prescription of duha. Some say it is an emphatic sunnah. Some say it is a non-emphatic sunnah. And some say it is recommended. And there is an opinion which says it is dislike. How could you ever say that? How could there be a difference of opinion while the hadith are very clear? Because this is called knowledge. A hadith, sound hadith collected by Imam Bukhari, Aisha radiallahu anha. And if any of you if any of you have read this hadith, he would, you know, I'm not going to pray duha anymore. Well, in the same sound collection, there are encouraging a hadith to pray duha. And how would you figure this out on your own? You can't. You have to be walked through. You have to be assisted by a scholar, a tutor, who attend the halqas of knowledge. So, the Prophet وسلم, Aisha is quoting that. إن كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم لا يدع العمل وهو يحب خشية أن يفرض على أصحابه وإني ما رأيت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يسبح صبحة الضحى قط. she says sometimes the messenger of Allah peace be upon him would interrupt some nawafil he would not do it out of fear that his companions would take it as mandatory they would perceive it as wajib and they would do it all the time. So even though he would love to do it, but deliberately he would interrupt it. Then she gave an example and she said, by the way, I have never seen the messenger of Allah praying duha. Some people would take this last segment out of context and say it's dislike to pray duha. It doesn't say that. It means that sometimes the Prophet wasallam, even though he encouraged us to pray duha, even every day if we can, for our many hadith in this regard, but sometimes he would interrupt it. So that the companions who will be the legislators for the next generations perceive it right. It is simply sunnah. It is not a wajib. Oh, I can give you tens of examples right now. But as the Sheikh said, this is not the right place to discuss all of that. Or oh, it simply may cause confusion to... You know, once in San Diego, I was asked to teach a course uh, of principles of jurisprudence. مرة واحدة يا شيخ أسام أصول الفقه I said أصول الفقه one shot they said yes I said no because I've taught there they are college students I said none of you is qualified to study أصول الفقه now and Ali ibn Abi Talib رضي الله عنه said it is such a big sin to talk to people about something which they don't understand and they may misunderstand it and they end up be lying or rejecting something that Allah or His Messenger have said. Talk to people with what they comprehend and they can afford to understand. Jazakallah.
We kindly ask again the shaykh and respectfully to keep time. The next, <laughs> you don't have to say shaykh, you can just say Sheikh Muhammad. <laughs> I'm smart enough to get it. <laughs> the next question goes uh, to Oh, you know what? Don't give me tough questions. <laughs> the next question goes to Sheikh Yusuf Estes. The question says, how can you deal with the media's tarnishment of Islam? How what? How, what, how can we deal with the media's tarnishment of Islam? I can put the mic down so I can hear you. How can we deal with the media's tarnishment of Islam? Tarnish. Are you saying tarnish? Got it. Got it, got it, got it. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam wa rasulullah wa ala alihi wa sabihi ajma'in wa shadu wa la ilaha illallah wa shadu muhammad rasulullah. Watch how fast. Watch how fast. Watch and learn. Go to the internet and type in Shake Google. S H E I K G O O G L E. Don't put a H after the K. Don't do that. Shake Google. Google or search for Islam then it's a website like Google but it has the will you see it it's funny type in the word H A R S H harsh and it will give you so many answers from so many scholars how you deal with the harsh treatment of Islam Questions individually and questions collectively and the harsh statements of the media, we put it all there. Hundreds of beautiful answers and it's free, no ads, no spam. Okay? For real, Sheikh Gugun? <laughs> you got a computer, check it out. <laughs> and while you're checking it out, hey, shh! I'm talking here. While you're checking it out, type in shareislam.com. S H A R E I S L A M. Shareislam.com. When you see this, you'll see why it's so popular with non Muslims. They love the images, the colors, they love the way that it works so easy. You don't have to think. Today's people on the internet, they don't like to think. They don't. Is that true or false? You know that. Shareislam.com is built by a number of our volunteers just like you, helping us put it on there. Shareislam.com, if you don't find the answers from those, it's many websites woven together. It's beautiful. But if you still don't find the answer, shake Google or search for islam.com got it next question that will be all for you Jazakallah. the next question goes to Sheikh Abu Osama the question states like, like this why is it wrong for the media why is it wrong for a sister to post her pictures on social media please explain Many things can be said about it, but we start with the statement that the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam al Mar'atu Aura. Ida kharajat istashrafaha shaitan. The woman is an aura. And the aura is that thing that should not be seen like the aura of your body. You shouldn't show it unless it's absolutely necessary. If she goes outside, shaitan beautifies her. Even if she's wearing in, in this religion, stay in your homes and don't make the display like they used to do in the times of Al Jahiliya when they used to try to come out and they would smell the, like perfume and they would walk in a seductive way and they used to wear bangles and things to make noise to draw to cause the attention of 
the people who are not her maharam to look at her. So when she puts her picture on the social media forum, you think she's exposed. This ayat, stay in your homes and don't make the display like the times of Jahiliya, doesn't mean she can't come out. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his companions, those women, the sahabiyat, may Allah be pleased with them, they used to come to the masjid. They used to go out. Men. So if they walked down the street, they would walk close to the wall and leave the rest of the sidewalk to the men. They didn't walk in the middle of the street in order to pass by men and so forth and so on. They did their best to stay away from the men. In the masjid, in the masjid during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu there was a door called the door of the women. They used to come in that door and they used to go out that door. It was exclusively for them. And it was so that men and women wouldn't mix in the best place which is the place of the best people because the people practicing the deen usually are the ones who are going to the masjid and also, also, also in that masjid people are usually going to have a higher level of a taqwa and yet those precautions were put in place in order to do our best to separate the two sexes the best row for the men is the first one the worst row is the last one best row for them is the first row because of the close proximity between the last row of the men and the first row of the women in the masjid so even in the masjid we are commanded to have a high level of adab they asked Fatima Ali ibn Abi Talib what is the most beloved thing to the believing woman she said for her not to see men who are not her maharam and for them not to see her that was something that was liked by the companions in the me myself and I culture this culture right here where we want people to know here I am here I stand the sister puts her picture on the social media outlets so these are some of the reasons why as your brothers where your uncles and your brothers we're not happy for our daughters, for our wives. We're not happy for them, and we won't allow them to put their picture on social media. We wouldn't allow that. Our grown daughters, we wouldn't do that. Our wives, we wouldn't do that. And we're not going to be happy with something like that for people like you. You know, the Prophet Sallallahu when he conquered Mecca, he conquered Mecca, he let those people go for what they did to him during the course of El Islam. But he told his companions, but when you go to Mecca, when we're in Mecca, if you find this guy and that guy and that guy, even if he's hanging on to the curtain of the Kaaba, kill him. And I told you people in the hadith of Thumama radiallahu anhu, probably used to give everybody, used to give people a pass, a green light. He would let you get off because he was a gentle man. He was kind. But these men, he said, even if you find them holding on to the curtain of the Kaaba, still kill him. Why? One of the reasons is that those three men used to say things about his wives, about their mahasin, their beauty. They don't know nothing about his wives mahasin, but that was the ghair of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and it's the Islamic jealousy in al-Islam. So it's not permissible for the woman to put that thing up where every Amr, Bakr, and Zaid can look at her picture to get an idea of what's going on. And me, as a husband, as a brother, you guys, husband, brothers, we have a religious responsibility as well to not allow that to happen. Allah knows best. Assalamu alaikum. Sheikh Asim, this question goes to you. I have made so many promises to Allah that I will not repeat certain sins, but I often backslide. And now I have a lot of fasting to do because of breaking my promises to Allah and people as well. So what do I do? Bismillah, alhamdulillah, salatu wassalam ala rasulillah. This is one of the great misconceptions among Muslims. When they make a, an oath, Wallahi, I will not do this. They think that once you break it, you fast. This is wrong. The ayah is crystal clear. Those who break their oath, the, when they swear by Allah Azza wa Jal, they should feed 10 poor people or 
clothe ten poor people or free a slave if none of the three previously mentioned is applicable due to financial reasons definitely then you may resort to fasting so bad news you have to feed ten poor pe uh, uh, people for every oath you break and the oaths that are to be given expiation for are those in the future if the sheikh says did you take my wallet is wallahi i did not take your wallet there's no expiation this is in the past if i made it, uh, an oath thinking that this is true can you give me a hundred shillings wallahi i don't have a hundred shillings in my pocket and then i search and i found one there's no expiation because i did what i thought was true the expiation is on things in the future. Wallahi, I will not come tomorrow to your house and eat biryani. I will not. I don't like biryani. But if it was something else and I changed my mind, give the expiation and go. There's no problem in that. So in your case, Akhi, if you made a number of oaths on the same thing, Wallahi, I will not smoke and you smoked. Then said, Wallahi, I will not smoke and smoked and kept on doing this. If you repented and want to expiate, you expiate one expiation because it's on the same thing. But if you said, Wallah, I will not smoke and I will, I will not miss Fajr and I will not uh, watch TV and I will not listen to music. Each one is a different thing and each one needs a different expiation. And Allah has blessed. Three minutes. It's not yet. Okay, 37 seconds left. Don't mess with me. <laughs> <laughs> Never. Ahsan Allah ilayk. The next question goes to Sheikh Abdul Latif. Are children allowed to refuse to associate with their maternal aunties because they had differences with their late mother? Are children allowed to visit their aunties? Are they allowed because they had, the auntie had problem with their mother before she died? Bismillah uh, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Salatu salam ala Rasulullah wa ala alihi wa sahibi ajma'in mba'ad. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after uh, commanding us to wa'abudullah wa la tushiku bil shay' wa bil walidayn ihsana wa bil al-qurub wal yatama wal masakin so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, instruct us uh, to keep the family bonding together um, differences between other people they, they don't concern you of course um, from your mom uh, and so on and so forth. But then we should look at uh, what were the differences. Uh, were the differences based on, on Sharia or they were just personal issues uh, and so on and so forth. So um, uh, such question, I, I believe uh, we have to look at it from, from a wider perspective. Uh, one, was the difference based on Sharia or not? Yeah, uh, Maybe it, they were just personal differences. That, that aside, eh? But then um, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam enjoins us uh, and, and to, to join to Mankata. Uh, no, to to yeah, to connect uh, from those who have cut you. So uh, Islam um, enjoins us to uh, to be together to. Uh, uh, to bring the bonding together <clears throat> and um, we don't have the, this concept like uh, nucleus family extended family and so on and so forth yeah uh, but uh, the community is made up of uh, the family units my unit Sheikh Abdurrahman's unit uh, unit uh, uh, Sheikh Saeed you, uh, family unit it, it makes uh, the community so if we are all cut into pieces and then the uh, bonding in the Muslim community will be very weak. Um, I will advise that uh, we try to reconcile and, and forgive each other. Allah Barakallahu uh, The next question goes to Sheikh Ahtani. It's a long question, but I summarized it. Uh, the question says that they are always busy in their worldly thing, be it professional, in they're always busy in their worldly thing, be it professional work or personal life with families. How can someone live his life throughout as ibadah 
as like praying and fasting, how can he make his life full of ajr? بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاه والسلام على رسول الله اتذكر قبل عامين في هذه الحديثه in the same place that we answered that question نعم i don't remember شيخ المسلم اعماله تنقسم في الاصل الى قسمين he say in the natural state that the act or actions of a muslim is divided in two parts القسم الاول العبادات the first part is the acts of worship الصلاة والصيام وسائر أعمال العبادة المفروضة والمستحبة المسنونة. He say the obligatory, obligatory prayer in the act of worship such as prayers and fasting and zakat and so on and also the voluntary prayers and other voluntary acts. والجزء الآخر من حياتنا. And the second part of our lives. يعني عادات الإنسان التي يمارسها في يومه وليلته. Or his routine and habit and rituals or practice things that he does. من غير العبادات. Which is outside of the fold of act of worship. كالطعام والشراب والمنام. Such as food, drinking and sleep. واللباس والعمل. You know, clothes and jobs. والمعاملات والمعاشرات. And dealing, buying, selling and dealing with people. And the family affairs. إخوات الكرام. My respected brothers. من خصائص هذه الأمة. You see, from that the specialties of this ummah or the uniqueness of this ummah. أن الله عز وجل لا يأجرنا فقط على العبادات. That Allah Subhanahu wa Taala will not only reward us based by based on acting or act of worships. بل هو يعطينا أجرا وثوابا حسنا حتى على عاداتنا. He said rather Allah سبحانه وتعالى rewards even the things that we do normal normal things habits and so on. فمثلا for example النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم إن الله يرضى عن العبد يأكل الأكلة فيحمده عليها. He said Allah سبحانه وتعالى is pleased for his servant by that servant eating or consuming food and praising Allah for it. ويشرب الشربة فيحمده عليها. and he drinks drink and he praises Allah سبحانه وتعالى for it. النوم. he says sleep. يقول الصحابي رضي الله عنه. he says الصحابي may Allah be pleased with him said. إني أحتسب على الله نومتي. he say I count on my sleep in terms of rewards. كما أحتسب على الله قومتي. as I count on my action while I'm awake. إذا قام المسلم في الفجر. is a Muslim is awake. لأداء صلاة الفجر. he performs the صلاة الفجر. فإنه يؤجر على هذا ال 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 النية نية القيام أصلاً. he will be rewarded for that intention the intention of قيام. فإذا كان نام بهذه النية. but if he should which is. نام حتى هذا النوم على القيام لطاعة الله عز وجل. Which is the intention of that he would go to sleep so he have enough strength to establish the qiyam al layl. فإن ما بين نومته وما بين قومته ثمان ساعات من النوم يؤجر عليها جميعا. You see, for those eight hours that he spent sleeping, he will be rewarded for them. إخوة الكرام حتى العمل. You say, my dear brothers, even your work. والنفق على الأهل. And spending on your family. وعلى الأولاد. Children. درهمان. يقول عليه الصلاة والسلام درهمان. The messenger of Allah said, درهم. درهم تنفقه في سبيل الله. That you give for the sake of Allah. تنفقه على. You spend on your children. خيرهما أي أكثرهما أجرا. You said the best or the most rewarding of those two dirhams. خيرهما الذي تنفقه على عيالك. The best of those two dirhams is the one that you spend on your family. وقال عليه الصلاة والسلام. And the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم. Even what you put. في man puts في في امرأته أي من الطعام. In the mouth of his wife means food. أسألكم وقد سألتكم في ذلك الحين. He said, I am asking. I ask you also in the past. من منكم عمل هذا الشيء? Which one of you did this act? ها؟ ما يكون رياء؟ لا لا ليس رياء يا محمد. ها؟ من منكم 
أخذ شيئًا من الطعام وقد أحضرته له زوجته فوضعه في فمها. So which one of you, when his wife served him food, took a bite of that or took? No. من فعل هذا؟ Which one of you did that? Ah, mashallah, shudja. So we only have three, three. Three. Umtaz jiddan. Out of thousands. Three. It's good, mashallah. Better than last year. For كل حياة المسلم. He said, you know, the Muslim's life. من عبادات ومن عادات. From act of worship or you know habits and ritual. يؤجر عليها. He will be rewarded for all of them. إلا أنه لا تقبل منه العبادة. You say except that the ibadah would not be expect, accepted from him. إلَّا مَعْنِيَةَ الْإِخْلَاصِ لِلَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلَّ Except that it comes with good intention, pure intention for Allah. وَلَا تُصْبِحُ الْعَادَةَ عِبَادَةَ And the habit will never be an act of worship. إلَّا إِذَا قَصَدَ بِهَا التَّقَوِّي عَلَى طَاعَةِ اللَّهِ Unless your intention is to do that habit for to gain strength for the sake of ibadah of Allah. وَلِذَلِكَ النِّكَاحِ فِي الْإِسْلَامِ You say therefore marriage in Islam. نصف الدين. Half of your deen. It is half of your deen. فلا تقلق يا أخي ولا تخاف. He said, don't worry and don't be afraid. أخرج من بيتك للعمل. He said, go from your home to your work. وفي نيتك. And your intention is. أن تكسب الرزق الحلال. That you will earn halal earning. آه لتنفقه على نفسك. So you can spend it on yourself. وحوائج أسرتك. And the need of your family. وتنفق من فضلته على إخوانك المسلمين. And the ex the extra of that you spend it on your Muslim. أكثر تكون نيتنا في كل الأعمال. This is how our intention should be in all actions.